you can ask me how many of those founders I met prior to investing in them. Zero, I think. We completely invest in Zoom. Because he didn't want to pay for lunch. Because I didn't want to pay for lunch. <laughs>
if there are no clawbacks and there's no interest rate tag to it, how should the investors be approaching such deals? So this might be maybe a little bit controversial in Southeast Asia. They're venture capitalists. And I think sometimes they forget the venture part of venture capitalism, right? Like you don't get into venture capitalism for downside protection. Venture capitalism is all about upside. And so I think if they're spending a bunch of time worried about downside protection, I, I kind of feel like they're in the wrong profession a little bit, right? They should be thinking about upside and then betting on the right companies. And if the company doesn't work out, you should lose your money, right? Yes. That's the business we're in. And I fully agree with you because I think one of the first few documents that I've seen in startup investments in Southeast Asia were really taken from the PE deals, yeah. which have a very different investment yep. structure and different risk profile. So as much as VC funds do have the obligation to do their due diligence, making sure that the founders deliver on what you know they promise, for example, finding the right product market fit, founders need the flexibility to be able to move with the market, for example. So if a term sheet or a shareholders agreement has two tight clauses, it's very difficult for the founder to respond to the market as the company grows. Now that the startup scene has taken a bit of a twist where, mm. you know, uh, we've seen banks running off money and startups running off money and startup founders being uh, thrown into jail for using the funds inappropriately. Does your outlook towards um, investment terms change? No, they don't for me. Um, again, I think as much as our investment philosophy is we want to be aligned with the founders as much as possible. So we do well when they do well, and that's just never going to change. If I thought that the market was so bad that I would needed to get downside protection on our money and all that, I probably would just stop being a venture capitalist because that's just kind of like against the ethos that I have. Now, what we are seeing in the market now is that as the market has kind of slowed down and there's less competition for deals, these terms are starting to creep back in. I think when companies were really hot and funding was getting done really quickly, they had to be competitive. It's just, it's a market, right? And so they had to be competitive and they took a bunch of these terms out and they wanted founders to say yes to them. Now it's kind of moving back. So now that VCs are kind of in the driver's seat a little bit, they can put some of these terms in. I think I was just reading a LinkedIn post by um, somebody and they were saying that they started seeing liquidation preferences of like four and five X, which is like, to me, kind of like wild, but you probably can, I've not bit. seen those. You haven't seen those? <laughs> yeah. But it used to be like 1.2, yes, 1. 1.5, 1. something like yeah. that, right? So mm -hmm. four is kind of like crazy. So I think we're going to see more of these deals come on. My advice to founders is at the very least, you should know what you're signing up for. Yeah. And so if it's a decision that you have to make to keep your company in life, fine. But you got to know what you're signing up for. Yes, yeah, so I mean, terms we typically avoid would be things like personal guarantees, making sure there are caps on founder liabilities. Gosh. But how do you deal when, you know, the startup runs out of money? Let's say you invested three million in yeah. a startup and yeah. they burn that cash off. Mm -hmm. Like, how would you deal with it as an investor? If we invested money and the founders did what they were supposed to do, which is give an honest try at running the business and they tried hard and they did all the right stuff, we don't do anything, Okay. right? We basically talked to the founder and we said, hey, we appreciate that you worked your hardest and did your best. Yeah. These things don't work out sometimes, right? Do you ask them to like pay fees for like the oh winding up? <laughs> no, we don't, they, look, nothing, right? So having been in their shoes before, for a founder to wind down the company, it's way more painful for them than mm. it is for me. So to ask them in their moment of kind of like at their very bottom to do something to sway how I'm feeling seems ridiculous. Right. Um, there's this old adage that I like. Um, I think Mark Andreessen said this, but he said venture capitalists make the majority of their returns on their top 5% of deals and they make their reputation on the remaining 95%. And I think that's really important. Right. So, yeah, a lot of companies and again, venture capitalists, most of our time that we make investments, they're not going to turn into anything. And that's fine. We need to be graceful and kind of like how we treat founders and then. And I often say, like, Great. Let me know if you're when you're ready to work on something else. I'm happy to kind of fund you again. Now, there's some people who kind of like maybe they didn't try. They didn't use the money in kind of like good faith or I don't know if there's fraud. OK, that's like a whole separate case. But as long as the founders use it in good faith and really kind of tried and set out to do something, then I'm perfectly fine. So, so can we're been very founder friendly on this video. But on the flip side, as an investor, yeah. how do you identify a fake founder, for example. It's hard these days. And the reason why it's hard these days is it used to be when we were fundraising for our companies, you actually have to meet all the investors that you're pitching to. So it was like kind of face to face and it's a little bit harder to kind of like, okay, this is a real person. <laughs> then COVID happened and basically all fundraising now happens on Zoom. So I've invested in like a hundred companies. You can ask me how many of those founders I met prior to investing in them. Zero, I think. We completely invest in Zoom. 
Because he didn't want to pay for lunch. Because I didn't want to pay for lunch <laughs> and I'm kind of an introvert and many other reasons. But we didn't meet any of them, right? So there's a part of it is like, oh my gosh, how are these people going to run away with the money and all this kind of stuff? It hasn't happened yet, just for the record, in case any of my investors are listening to this. It hasn't happened yet. It can be hard to spot unless you're kind of doing kind of like real DD. So I think the question when you're like first meeting them is, is their story consistent? Their deck has this number, then they say a different number and you're kind of like picking up all of these signals. And look, sometimes it's just an honest mistake. If it happens over and over and kind of like different parts, you start getting like, okay, is this person negligent? Like they just don't know what their numbers are or are they kind of like making stuff up? For us, as we're drilling into kind of people and talking to people about what they're working on, these things tend to like come out a bit more. So what are the terms that you would think founders, if they sign or don't sign, would regret. So I think we talked a lot about terms that people should avoid. And I think like if you sign a deal with any of those terms, I think you're going to regret it. But the liquidation preferences is a very common term. Mm -hmm. And it's the one that my founder friends regret not negotiating it more. And I think the reason why this is the one for me that I think founders regret the most is founders are optimists. So when I'm signing this term sheet and there's four X liquidation preferences, I'm like, I'm not selling for 40 million anyway. I'm gonna sell this thing for a billion and it's not going to matter. And by the way, if they put in $10 million and I sell it for a billion, liquidation preferences don't matter at all, right? Because there's a billion dollars to spread out. So they get the first 40 million, who cares, right? And then the reality sets in and it's like, it turns out selling a company is not so easy and selling a, a company for a billion dollars is even more rare. Trying to sell the company for $40 million, all of a sudden the investors make Forex and then you just spent seven years of your life working in this company and you don't get anything out of it. And you just have that kind of like regret where you're like, wow, I spent all this time. Actually, the company was worth a significant amount of money and I'm not gonna walk away with any of this. So in Southeast Asia, the startup scene is relatively new. So what are the key exit strategies or plans you see for startups in this region? The possible exits are the same as in the US. So the company can get bought out, um, it can go IPO. They just happen at less frequency than they are in the US. So there's not as many startups that IPO here as opposed to the US and there's less acquisitions than there are in the US. The interesting thing I think about Southeast Asia is there is more secondary shares that are sold in Southeast Asia than they are in the US. And what I mean by secondary shares is, let's say that I invest in Rachel's company. I'm like one of the first investors in it. She does really well. She was raising a series B. I can sell my shares to one of her new investors if they would like, and then I get money back from those investors. And by the way, Rachel could also sh sell some of her shares in that moment, which, you know, between founders, we always say is taking some money off the table. Basically. Yes. So in Sukhan's words, you're really looking at tag along clauses. So if you have a tag along wow. clause, you may not be able to sell your shares in a secondary market. And the other term that you'll be looking at is um, right of first refusal, right of first offer. So as an investor, you are not allowed to sh transfer your shares to third parties before going through a very, very vigorous mechanism. Then that option may not be available for you on the table as well. And by the way, I think if, if you're an investor and you're selling your shares in a company, you should talk to the founder first. There shouldn't be kind of like surprises this way. So, you know, I think some of these terms are good. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen, <laughs> uh, which is kind of foul play in kind of my sense in Southeast Asia. We had a company that was worth quite a lot uh, after we invested. I think we had like, it was like something crazy. It was like 50X in like 12 months or something like that. And they were raising this new round and people wanted to buy our shares. Mm. And we didn't know what to do because that just had never happened before. And so we asked kind of other friends who were venture capitalists and we're like, hey, what do you guys typically do in the sense? And what was interesting is the US VCs all unanimously said, don't sell. They said, you don't wanna be the person that sold Google at their series A, you wanna ride that all the way to IPO. Every single Southeast Asia investor was like, you should sell because they haven't seen that story of like that many Googles and that kind of stuff. And so I think there's like an interesting kind of like dynamic here of like when to take your profits on some of these. In terms of IPO, do you see any IPO market emerging in Southeast Asia? It was starting to look more promising, I think when the market was hot and now it's like dead, right? It's For like, now. For now. <laughs> and, and, and look, I, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I'm old enough to have seen these things happen before. They're cycles, they're healthy. This has happened before, it will happen again and we will get back to the hot markets in those other times. So this is all, as far as I'm concerned, just like part of the process. Um, and I think Southeast Asia will become come out of this like much healthier than it was before. Those kind of boom times where startups are getting like crazy valuations and stuff, I don't think are ultimately like always healthy. And so we, we need kind of a little bit more balance and unfortunately it just swings quite a lot. But 
we'll be fine a couple of years. It'll be it'll be work out. So Sukan, how does Iterative typically work? So if I'm a startup founder, mm-hmm. I'm interested in raising some capital from Iterative. Mm-hmm. How should I prepare myself for um, a pitch with you? Our process is pretty straightforward. And again, I think we invest so early. So we get quite a number of applications online. So there's like a short application process. And then we basically only do two phone calls. So you're going to talk to somebody who is typically one of our founders who does the initial screen. And then you're going to do a phone call with either Brian and I. And then we just make a decision from there. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Process and we can invest in as quickly as like a couple of days oftentimes. Um, maybe an interesting thing here is most VC firms are consensus driven. And so let's say you and I run a VC firm. Most VC firms are you got to convince me and you got to convince her. It's not how we work. Um, we unilaterally make deals. And so there are deals that Brian has done that I hate and don't want to do. So Brian's your wife. Brian's my work wife, yes. And vice versa. And so that just speeds up our process. And what are you looking for in a founder? I break it up into four parts that I'll try to kind of do quickly. The first part is everybody says they're looking for founders who execute well. The way that we define execute well is they do what they say they're going to do. The best founders say they're going to do something by Monday and then Monday comes along, they did that thing and they're like, I'm going to do this next thing by Monday or I'm going to grow this fast. Everything that they say, they always do it. And so that's my definition of good execution. And those people are really scary. If they just consistently do what they say they're going to do, very scary, right? Like Rachel, <laughs> be like Rachel. The second thing we look at is we look for founders who are convincing. And I say convincing, not charismatic. I think you can be convincing without being charismatic. And I don't want to exclude people who don't think of themselves as charismatic. But as a founder, as you know this, oftentimes your job is to go around the world and convince people of stuff. I got to go convince this investor they should give me money. I got to convince this person to be my co-founder. I got to convince this person to pay me money. You're just going around convincing people of stuff. And so if you can't convince people of stuff, I think you're in for kind of like a hard time. The third thing we look at is motivation. And so we like to invest in founders who are internally motivated, not externally motivated. So externally motivated is like money, fame. You want to be cool, like LinkedIn profile, LinkedIn profiles, all of that stuff. Forbes 30 under 30, which is one of my least favorite things in all of existence, Me too. which just came out and we have a bunch of founders that are on it. And I got mad at all of them for wasting their time on this instead (laughs) of uh, actually working on their startups. And so those are external motivations. Internal motivations are you really care about the problem. Mm. You think startups are really interesting um, or you really like the challenge or whatever it is. The reason why this matters is startups are really hard. And if you notice, all the external motivated stuff is tied to outcomes and results. And all the internally motivated stuff is not tied to outcomes. And at a startup, you go up and down all of the time. And so if you are tied to the results and the outcome, you're going to quit at some point. And if you're internally motivated, you just don't care as much about the outcome. You're like, things are bad, I still care about the problem. Things are good, still care about the problem. And so you just won't quit. Mm. The fourth part here is maybe a little bit more controversial. I always look for a rebellious streak in founders because I think founders almost by definition, they look at a world a little bit differently than everybody else. And they're like, why does the world work like this? That's stupid. The contrarians. Right? Somebody should do something about that. Yeah. And so I think a lot of times we're looking for that streak. And I think... Founders have to get creative sometimes too. Oftentimes you hear early founder stories of how they kind of grew is they did something that wasn't illegal. But they're pushing the boundaries. But it's kind of gray and where it's socially unacceptable. I think one of the problems that Southeast Asian startup founders have is that the market is not so homogeneous. Oh, yeah. So how should startup founders navigate this problem? So this is really hard. Um, and. If I'm being honest, I kind of feel like founders in Southeast Asia are playing on like a harder difficulty than founders in the United States and even in China. Both of those markets are very huge Mm. and homogenous. And so you don't have to kind of work as hard to kind of do all this localization and all of that stuff. And so Southeast Asia founders have it kind of tough, right? I think there's a couple of things that I would recommend founders do if they're trying to kind of like get into these different countries. The first part of it is you just have to recognize what are the differences between the like countries. I think this is something that I think foreigners kind of struggle with. They like land in Southeast Asia and they're like, Indonesia is like Thailand and it's like Vietnam and they kind of think about it all of the same and then they run into a lot of trouble when they find out that it's not. And so you want to spend time in some of these countries to like learn some of the nuances specifically kind of for your business. And I think the typical playbook here, if you're at the point where you're expanding into different countries is you want to get a really good local country manager who can like look at your business and you can work with uh, in that country. And ideally, the best case scenario is 
a local person or at least somebody who has lived there for like a long time so they can help translate what your business means in those markets. And so I think that's the first good step is get a really good senior person who understands that market and ideally is local if you can get it. Final question for Sue Ken. Is Singapore food or Malaysian food better? No, don't answer that question. With, Malaysian this, food, don't cut this out. Malaysian food. On this note. Put this in the credits. Thank you, Sukan, for um, sharing your insights and experiences with startup founders. And we truly appreciate that. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you liked it, remember to connect with Sukan and share with him your latest billion dollar startup idea. Stay tuned for more videos. And till we next meet, keep well and stay good.